everyone. I'm John Evans. Welcome to the one-on-one -on -one with John Evans podcast year in review for 2021. First off, before we go any further, I want to thank all of you who have downloaded and listened to the episodes that we have done this year. And thank you also for sending the feedback and letting me know what you think of the interviews that we did over this year, which is now season five for this award-winning podcast. I interviewed a lot of authors this year. Several of them had ties to Southeastern North Carolina or wrote about this area in their books. Others, well, I've just been fans of for many years and wanted to learn more about them. Nick Oshner and Michael Graff are fellow journalists who teamed up to release The Vote Collectors in 2021, a book about the voter fraud scandal in southeastern North Carolina that cost a man his seat in Congress. Now, Nick and Michael worked to cover the story for their respective news organizations, but they also decided to dig deeper, unearth more facts, look at documents, talk to all of the players involved in the controversy and put together their book, which is a fantastic read about the history of this part of the state as well. As they proceeded on, they told me they really weren't surprised by a lot of what they found, but Nick said during our interview that at first he didn't think that the story was going to be a big deal. To be quite frank, I didn't want to cover the 9th Congressional District story when it first came out. I didn't think it was going to be a story that went anywhere growing wow. up in that part of the world. This is just, I mean, you've heard it. If you've worked, you know, you've worked in Wilmington for how long in Southeastern North Carolina, there are always the speculation and always these rumors, right? Mm -hmm. um, and a and fraud. And we saw in 2016 where uh, the Pat McCrory campaign used McRae Dallas to file a, a complaint to, in a long shot effort to question the results of, of the 2016 gubernatorial race that he had lost. And that resulted in nothing, right? Well, it actually resulted in 300 pages of investigative file that got ignored, but functionally nothing publicly. <laughs> but that's another um, podcast episode. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh, but, but my point being, we've heard this for a long time. And the first words I said in person to McRae Dallas when I got to his driveway the first time I met him was, I don't know what you have or haven't done, but I know you're not the only person who's done it. And I still believe that. And I think what we talk about in the book proves that out to be true. And so, uh, frankly, um, yes, it was a lot of work to assemble all of what we found, but I'll also say I knew it, there was more stuff there than what was being reported at the time. And it was really just a matter of going to, to dig for it and find it. But I can't say I was surprised. New York Times bestselling author Wiley Cash lives here in Wilmington. And I talked to Wiley this year as he released his fourth novel called When Ghosts Come Home, the first of his novels that he set along the coast of North Carolina. We talked a lot about Wiley's career. He also teaches and does a lot of speaking along with his writing. We talked about how he decides to set books in different parts of the state. But what fascinated me is the process for how he goes about writing one of his books. I don't really have an idea of where I want the plot to go. And um, I kind of try to come up with, with characters who feel interesting, who feel relevant, who feel kind of mysterious to me as well. Cause I'm gonna be spending a lot of time with these people and I want them to feel mysterious to me. And so I really try to, to create characters that I know I can spend some considerable time with, you know, the, the, the years and months it takes to write a novel like the ones that I write. Um, but I also, you know, I don't I don't type. I, I hand wrote this novel. I hand wrote uh, When Ghosts Come Home. And it really, really allowed me to slow down because I, I can type just fast enough where I can get ahead of my thoughts. And when you're a writer and you're looking at that blank, page or that blinking cursor that's death you, you think oh my gosh i don't have the words to, to fill that in but when i'm handwriting i can think faster than i can handwrite so my hand is constantly trying to catch up with my brain and that's a wonderful place for a writer to be where you feel panicked you know you're like how am i going to get all this stuff down that's that's a great that's a great way to work and to spend your days working 
And so with this book, I never ran out of words. I never ran out of characterization. I never ran out of scenarios to really put on the page. And so it was easier for me, as, as Brad Thor mentioned, or, or as you mentioned, as he does, to kind of feel my way through the book in, in a way that felt very organic to me. To me, to hear you say you handwrite in our time of technology, where, let's face it, penmanship is really not a high priority right mm -hmm. now. To hear you write just fascinates me. Well, if it makes you, if it, if it can, continues to fascinate, I also have a flip phone. <laughs> um, so I, I go as low tech as possible. I mean, I'm, granted, I'm joining you here on my laptop, on my MacBook Air uh, via Zoom, but. Wiley Cash's brother Cliff was also one of our interviews in 2021. I talked to Cliff Cash earlier in the year after his collection of stand-up comedy called Halfway There sat at number one on the iTunes comedy chart for three weeks. We talked a lot to Cliff about how he goes about developing and writing a joke and when is the best time to actually start performing it. But I also talked to him about when he tried to give up all the other things he did in his career and delve headfirst into stand-up comedy. And Cliff shared with me part of the inspiration to do that came from his brother. I, I kind of started trying stand-up just after he got his first two-book deal. And, and I, I think it really inspired me. Um, and he'll tell you, you know, leading up to getting the two book deal, it was a lot of a lot of people said no. And, it, you know, a couple agents and um, he was constantly submitting to literary journals and and um, and wasn't having the kind of luck that he was hoping for. But he didn't give up. He kept going for it. And and that's when he got the agent that he has now. And he in very short order got him a two book deal. And it was huge. And that first book was a New York Times bestseller. It was an Oprah magazine, uh, all kinds of publications and, and won awards all over the world. And I think just seeing somebody that I know that closely and intimately really go for it and not give up, it made me think like, well, you know, maybe I can do this thing that I really love. Like maybe I can really do it. You know, there's people do all the time. People succeed at something that they've, they've dreamed about. And I think the trick, you know, not to be a motivational speaker or sound cheesy, but I think the trick to all of it is you, you just don't give up. You just, whether it's a marriage or a business or a, a business idea or your art or your passion, if you just stay with it, you'll, you'll either succeed or you'll, or you'll die trying. And, and, you know, that's a life well lived if you've done the thing that you love your whole life. I've been a fan of New York Times bestselling author Brad Thor since he released the very first book in the series with operative Scott Harvath. It was called Lions of Lucerne. This year, I got the chance to interview Brad after he released the 20th book in the series called Black Ice. One of the things reviewers point out about Brad Thor's books is that they are so realistic about threats to the United States security and what operatives have to do to save the day. Well, during our conversation, Brad talked about one of his books, The Last Patriot, being so realistic that after it published, he actually got death threats about it. The Last Patriot, uh, the, the, the plot was that there were chapters left out of the Quran. And there's historical evidence that suggests the Quran did have material that didn't make it in. Uh, but to fictionalize that, to do kind of a James Bond meets Indiana Jones international intrigue story about trying to find those missing chapters and what what they what impact it might have on one of the world's major religions. It, it raised, a, I mean, the book was banned in Saudi Arabia. It, we did get death threats. Uh, and somebody, uh, I can't say who, but there was somebody with the government who stepped out of his government position to approach me and said, I'm not, you know who I am. I'm not coming to you as a representative of the US government, but I am going to put at your disposal certain people who are going to help you and your family stay safe. We're gonna teach you what you need to do, starting with, you gotta move. You're, it's not safe. I mean, we had a mail slot. Anybody could have thrown rattlesnakes right into the house. To this day, I worry because we did take, the steps we took were good and smart and prudent. 
Um, but I do wonder if it overshadowed the kids' lives a little bit. If, if all of a sudden ramping up the security to that degree, you try to insulate the kids, but they see all of it. Right. So as a father, my, my kids are wonderful, well-adjusted, beautiful, beautiful young adults. But I still, as a parent, wonder, could I have kept more of that hidden from them, kind of not let them see the layers we were enveloping ourselves in. But, you know, I did what I felt was the best thing to do at the time to protect the kids in my life. But as a dad, though, I mean, there's only so much you can say, hey, we're moving from Chicago to Tennessee. I mean, they're going to think something's up, right? Yeah, well, we moved within Chicago. So what oh, okay. we did was we, we moved within Chicago because the, the advice we got was make it really difficult for, the, for somebody to get you at home. Make them have to get you when you're in transit because you can change the directions you go and the times you leave and all this kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, it, it actually wasn't the Muslim violence that drove us to Tennessee. It was all the other violence in Chicago that drove oh, us to Tennessee oh, no. seven years ago. You can't get much more realistic than Jack Carr's series of novels. This year, I had the chance to talk to Jack after he released The Devil's Hand, the third book in the series involving operative James Reese about a potentially killer bioweapon threatening the United States. Jack Carr is a former Navy SEAL who now is doing his second career as a thriller writer. He's writing about a former Navy SEAL now working as an intelligence operative. And one of the things that Jack brings to his character is the realistic situations that he himself went through while serving his country overseas. Uh, it, what's helpful to me is that uh, I get to tap into some of the emotions and the feelings behind certain events, not necessarily the exact tactics or exactly what happened in Mosul or Baghdad or Ramadi or Kabul or wherever it was, but the emotions behind those experiences rather than interviewing someone and asking them questions about what it was like to be a, a SEAL sniper in Ramadi at the height of the war, and then taking those answers and they would filter their way through whatever biases I had, whatever uh, preconceived notions that I had, whatever other research that I'd done. And then I take that and apply it to a fictional narrative. Whereas in this case, I just remember what it was like to be a sniper in Ramadi in 06. And I take those feelings and emotions and I apply them directly into the narrative. So when the reader is, uh, is at that point in the story, the feelings and emotions behind whatever that paragraph is, they feel authentic, they feel real, and that's because those emotions come from a real place. But there's all sorts of things I can tap into because we have the things that have similarities. He likes right. Land Cruisers, as do I. Sure. Uh, he likes his copy the way I do, and, uh, and all those little things to kind of humanize the character, which I thought was important. Another New York Times bestselling author that we had the chance to talk to in 2021 is Kathy Reichs. A quarter of a century after releasing the very first book involving forensic anthropologist Temperance Brennan, Kathy released this year The Bone Code, 24 years after that first novel. Kathy lives here in the Carolinas, and along with being an author and writing about Temperance Brennan, she worked as executive producer on the CBS show Bones, which featured the character Temperance Brennan. Part of our conversation for the podcast talked about just how much input she had with the TV show that featured her character. Yeah, I had input. I didn't have any control. Once you option your character, they can pretty much, unless you specified in the contract. Um, but I, I was very clear that what I, I knew they were going to cast her younger than the, the Temperance Brennan in my books. I knew that they'd be set in Washington, D.C., not in the Carolinas and in Quebec. Um, the one place where I held the line is I didn't want them to make her a 22-year-old psychic or something like that. So, you know, we were, a, uh, she, I think Emily, when, when we started the series, was 29. And I was a little, wow, that's pretty young to have your have done all that she's supposed to have done at that point but it was a good thing because we went 12 years you know and david i think was 36 when we started so it was a good thing they were a little on the young side what kind of relationships did you build with emily david and all of the cast members you still call them now and say hi how are you i imagine working 12 years you probably did develop a close friendship and uh, almost like a family certainly we definitely like a family because we worked with that same group large group of people 
for 12 years. So you do become very close. Um, I still talk to Emily all the time. Um, when I go out to LA, I stay with Emily and her family. Um, I talk to Hart Hansen, our show runner all the time. I'm just, you know, been texting with him this morning, as a matter of fact. The others, uh, a little bit less. Um, I know if I picked up the phone and called TJ, or and he's the best hugger in the world, I'll tell you that. He gives <laughs> these bear hugs that are fantastic. Um, you know, that they would certainly pick up the call and talk to me, but they're busy. They've all, fortunately for them, moved on and are, you know, doing other things. David has the CBS show, the SEAL team, and um, Emily's been on Animal King. Anyway, they're, they're all quite busy. One of the most popular episodes we did this year was our conversation with another doctor, Dr. Manib Shah, who is a resident physician at Wilmington Dermatology Associates here in the city. Along with working as a dermatologist, Dr. Shah is a monster on social media. Listen to this. He has nearly 12 million followers on TikTok, nearly 750,000 followers now on Instagram. He's posted skincare videos that have gone viral and even mega viral since the start of the pandemic. And one of the parts of our conversation with Dr. Shaw was when he realized how much power he had posting those videos on social media. But, you know, the first time I posted one that had gone viral, um, it was I was actually wearing these exact scrubs and I had come home from clinic and it was a long day and I, I remember it was 8 p.m. or something like that and I and I laid in bed and I just had this idea. What if I say, if I, if I start off the videos explaining a skin condition with saying, what's on your skin, right? And I have mm -hmm. a picture of it behind me, what's showing on a, a, you know, a classic skin lesion. A lot of people have probably had it or experienced it. Right. Maybe it's poison ivy, maybe it's a skin tag. And I started a video out saying, what's on your skin, part one. And I just started like, describing like this is a skin tag and this is how it causes it and this is how you get rid of it and i posted three of those videos back to back like not thinking like almost as like a series and not thinking that any of them and they all went viral that night um and then once you start picking up the momentum people start watching your previous videos and then those videos start to pick up and then there was a video i had posted about things you um the worst skincare trends or something like that it was like part one of the, the worst skincare trends, part one. And it was just like, you know, jade rollers or putting ice on your face, just, you know, things that I, I see people do that I don't think really have long-term benefits to the skin. And that went like mega viral and like the newspapers picked it up. It was on like traditional news outlets and it just really started to take off and take a mind of its own. Um, and it kind of got virality out of sort of my control uh, that was on my platform that started to go out other places. And I realized like I just educated 15 million people on something that would take me a lifetime to teach this many people. Right, and so yeah. I realized from an educational standpoint, the power on this platform or on these platforms for dermatologists and people in these types of positions to counteract misinformation uh, was more than you could do in your lifetime by pe speaking to people face to face. And so I was like, I have to really take this seriously at this point. And so from then on, um, I was like, I need to make content that makes the meaningful difference. One of the more inspirational episodes we had in 2021 is Shaniqua Vereen. She grew up in the small town of Bolivia, North Carolina, a town with less than 200 people. But she now works as a public affairs specialist and live mission control commentator at NASA, an organization that has more than 17,000 employees. As she has risen through the ranks at NASA, one of the things Shaniqua told us that she recognizes now is how much of an example she is to young women, especially young women of color. And it's just not, it's not even just like doing the launches and such, but it's more like I now have a platform to not just, you know, share what NASA's doing, but, you know, I always tell everyone like, I've never thought I would be in a speaking role for NASA. I never thought I would be a face for NASA. You know, those things kind of happen. But I also, you know, with George Floyd dying and Black Lives Matter movement and those things happening right now, and even last year during the pandemic, um, it made me be like, hey, I have a voice and a platform. And as a Black woman from a small ADB town, a rural North Carolina, pretty much, 
I was like, it is important for people to see me for, um, for little girls, little boys, brown people in general. I feel like there's not a lot of people that look like me that work for NASA or not, not that don't work for NASA, but the ones that are on TV, you don't see a lot of, you know? Mm -hmm. And so um, I thought it was very important to have me represent. Um, and so uh, that was, I, I had an email, you know, and it was from a complete stranger who just kind of found my email and she was just kind of like, I'm so proud of you, you know? And, and she basically was like, I never thought, you know, that I would see someone who looked like me, you know? on the television for NASA and she was like and I've always been a NASA nerd and you know and I you know made Jemison as my hero and all these great things you know but she was just kind of like I am so proud of you she was a complete stranger you know and that made me feel like wow you know I oh, really you probably felt about 10 or 12 stories tall yeah I was like I you know just by being me and you know on a platform that I have for NASA, I was just kind of like, that made me feel like I, I made it. You know, I, I'm doing something worthwhile. I interviewed Alex Highsmith after his first season playing linebacker for the Pittsburgh Steelers of the National Football League. And he's playing well in his second season now. He's number six on the team in tackles so far in 2021. And as part of our interview, I asked Alex to give us a sense of what fans might not know about playing professional football? I'd say the first thing, probably uh, the, the the toll that it takes on our bodies. Um, you know, after after you know on Mondays after waking up from a game, you know, you feel like uh, you know you got in a car wreck. You know, if you play a lot of plays and stuff like that, your body's really hurting. And so, um, definitely that, and also uh, the film study. You know, there's uh, I feel like you know people who watch football don't know all the hours and extra extra time put in you know to, to study the film you know because you can go out there and practice all week but you know if you don't know your opponent know it's going to come then you know you're not going to make plays on Sunday and so I think you know um, so a lot of people don't really know the, the the extra work that a lot of us put in. I did two podcast episodes this year centered around the independent film called Drought shot here in southeastern North Carolina it started streaming on Amazon Prime Video earlier this year the first of the two episodes was with the all-everything duo of Hannah Black and Megan Peterson. They co-wrote the movie, co-produced it, co-directed it, and even co-starred in the film as well. It took several years to bring Drought from the original concept until it actually started streaming in 2021. And the two ladies shared with me how much they leaned on each other during that time. Sometimes it felt really intimidating. You know, I would be lying if I didn't say sometimes it was a, a topic of conversation of how. The how is really a scary question sometimes. How are we going to do this um, with limited resources and limited knowledge? Um, but you're right, can't just never happen. I don't think, I'm trying to think back. I, I don't know if it's because of, we, of our partnership, of the accountability with each other. If I said, I don't think we can do this, then I'm not just letting myself down, I'm letting Hannah down and, and the things she's created. So I think there was this mutual respect uh, in, and belief in each other that, that kept us going. Hannah, were there times when you had to pick one another up when it got to the point where it was like, you know, maybe it's not meant to be? Totally. I think that that's, again, the beautiful thing about a partnership is when one person is feeling really burnt out or just really feeling like this, I, again, not can't, but again, how, um, the other person goes and, and picks them up. And we've always been able to do that. And I think it's also because of Miser and because we know each other so well, we understand the reasons why the other person might feel defeated at the moment and how we can bring life back into them so that we can join back together and do the thing. It's, yeah, partnerships are a blessing for sure. The second episode I did surrounding the movie Drought came with Drew Scheid and his brother, 
Owen Shy. They co-starred in the movie opposite Hannah and Megan. Now Drew has done a lot of acting, but when this film shot, it was his first major role. Owen, it was his first role of any kind in a production. The result of Hannah and Megan wanting to cast an actor with autism to play the role of a character who has autism. And the two brothers shared with me just how nice it was to have each other on the set during that production. It was so fantastic. I mean, it was the best, because because there's, there's a little nervous thing of like, oh, you know, this is, this is my brother, this is family. Are we gonna have like, are we gonna just revert back to being little kids and <laughs> being brothers and stuff? But it was like, it was so fantastic to like have one of my best friends to be on a set with to like get to just work with in general like that was so amazing and then you know we both had like a lot of first times like that was like for Hannah and Megan to give me the gift of like like that, that was one of my that, that was at, at that time that was the like the the biggest most full uh, full dimensional character I've gotten to play so like I was also nervous about like I've never like done something like this so I had Owen to to lean on there and then you know, oh, and you, this is your first time on a movie set <laughs> in general. So we leaned on me and then we just, we both got to, it, it was great having someone that I was that close to, to get to work on this project, like get to like talk it out and work through it. Well, I thought it was an incredible experience. I thought, you know, and Drew did, being there, of course, that really helped to kind of ease better. Like, yeah, I've always been like interested in both movies. And I think uh, like the opportunity, opportunity came up, I think that was like, I said, yeah, maybe I should kind of look into it. I think, uh, you know, Drew gave me the trip script. He told me about it. And I thought it was, like, really interesting. I, I love the story. I thought, like, it's a very powerful message about acceptance and everything. And then even for the audition, I saw, like, the pitch video and everything. Around it, and I thought, yeah, I felt like, I felt like there's, like, great people behind this. I felt like, you know, going in, I think, you know, I learned a lot from the experience, of course. And, yeah, I think it was, like, great to, I think, like, I learned a lot. It was really helpful. Another duo that we talked to in 2021, Jay Leno and Kevin Eubanks. Back together again a decade after working together on The Tonight Show. Jay wanted to launch You Bet Your Life, and the first person he thought about working with on the production was Kevin Eubanks. Now, Jay has done car shows. He does garage shows. He still tours and does stand-up comedy. And I asked him, after all of these years of performing, why he just continues to do it. People always say, what well, are you working? Well, I, I like to, you know, if it's your hobby and you enjoy it, it's not work. Yeah. I mean, I like writing jokes. It's just, I, I, I'd be trying out in the guy at the garage. Hey, is this funny? Hey, is this funny? And now I just get to try him out on TV. So, you know, it, it, it's, it's a great job. It, it, you know, comedy's like golf. You can do it till you're 80 if you play the game correctly, you know? And... It's fun to interact with you. I never understand people in show business that refuse to sign autographs or don't want to meet the public. I, well, why are you in this business? I mean, it's the same thing you do for free that you get paid for. I realize that because what I used to do in school, what I used to do in college, when I got out, and then, I, oh, now I'm getting paid for it. So let's keep doing that. And I, I enjoy it. it. It's fun to interact with humans. I like that contact, you know. I like to see people's faces light up when they want some money or they, they were able to take care of a problem or whatever it might be. It, it just gives purpose, I think, to, to your life. Another Fox TV host that we talked to in 2021, Meredith Vieira. This year, she launched the third season of 25 Words or Less. Now, Meredith Vieira has done a lot in her television career that now spans almost four decades. Along with this show, she's done 60 Minutes. She co-hosted the Today Show. She had her own talk show. She co-hosted the Olympics. But she shared with us the fluke that actually started her broadcasting career. I got started in my career in, a, in really a, a weird way. I was a senior at Tufts University and floundering, essentially. I was an English major and didn't know what I was going to do next. In fact, I had gone to a secretarial school that the summer before I graduated to learn some skills because my mom said, you're not coming home. You're going to get a job. And I figured, OK, well, I was terrible. Thank God I didn't get a job <laughs> as a secretary because I was terrible as a typist, for sure, or shorthand. But I, I took a course for some reason at Tufts. I, I can't tell you why. I wasn't particularly interested in broadcast journalism, but I took the course. And the final assignment was we, we separated into teams. This was radio journalism. 
and we each produced a documentary and I voiced ours. And then the, the head of CBS radio came and listened to critique them, came and listened, and he said, whose voice is that? I said, uh, it's mine. And he took me on the hallway and he said, what are you doing when you graduate? I said, I don't know. And he said, I do. You're <laughs> going to have a big career. That was it. I said, really? Uh, okay. And he hired me as an intern at CBS Radio in Boston. And then I just started luck. And I, I, I'm a serious person in the fact that I work hard. And I discovered I, I enjoyed it. But I never really planned ahead. For it. I never intended to be in television. It was another fluke. Uh, a news director um, interviewed me, and it was for radio, and then he said, well, we have a position on TV as well. Would you be interested? I probably was too stupid to say, to think about it long enough to say, well, I don't know anything about that. So I, 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 I always led with yes. One of the big stories in 2021 is the resurgence of the entertainment industry in southeastern North Carolina. A lot of productions came to the Wilmington area to shoot this year. One of them, the Fox primetime show called Our Kind of People. Now, we got the chance when it launched to talk to Yaya DaCosta, one of the stars of the show who left Chicago Med to join this cast. We talked about her transition going from a model, an America's Top Model 3, to getting into acting. I wasn't as invested in it as a lot of people, right? Um, and so when it was over, I felt really, um, it was a very sensitive time. And I had, I had been hurt, you know, by my experience there. Um, and it took a long time for me to heal on a personal level and then to be in my you know, profession and have directors at the rap parties after the, sh after the film is filmed come up to me and say, uh, some extra, some background artists said that you were on a reality show, is that true? And I was like, oh yeah, you didn't know? And I was told twice, if we had known, we might not have even auditioned you, much less hired you. Really? Absolutely. And this was in 2006, you know, five, six. Wow. It was a very different time. And it was a lot at that time to be, um, to feel like I had, I had so much to prove, mm -hmm. you know, because you, if you look a certain way, then they're like, oh, she's a model. And I was like, well, I kind of just wanted to pay off my college loans and, <laughs> the, you know, Kohl's catalog is paying me more than this off-Broadway play, so I'm going to do that right now. <laughs> and I stopped after, like, 2007. I didn't do it for very long. Um, but it was something that I had to navigate. And then, you know, over the years, I've just learned to be grateful for the experience now that, you know, I'm an adult. And, and, and almost it's almost as if the whole world had an awakening. And they're like, oh, my goodness. I can't believe we thought that was okay, or I can't believe we watched that and didn't see the issues with it. And even Tyra Banks herself has come out and apologized for certain things. But as an adult, you know, who did, you know, who did my work, who did my healing, and who insisted on being taken seriously in my craft, I just am now at a place of pure gratitude because people remember me from that show, and they've, they've followed me to Chicago Med and now to our kind of people. And that's just... That's just really heartwarming and a, a wonderful blessing. Another one of the big entertainment stories of 2021, the opening of the downtown Wilmington Riverfront Amphitheater and the Live Oak Bank Pavilion, bringing in some big name concerts in its very first year. One of the big name bands booked in year one, the Hall of Famers Chicago. They've been around for more than 50 years. And I had the chance to talk to one of the original members, trumpet player Lee Lockney. And Lee shared with us how much they value the fans coming out to their shows more now than when they started. I think it's more intense now than it, than it ever was because we didn't believe it in, in the beginning. We didn't think that, you know, we thought we'd have one album, maybe two. And, you know, so to be doing our 38th album, recording our 38th album now, it's like, that can't happen. That's not going to happen. What are, what are we going to be together for life? Uh, yeah, it looks like it. You know, so we'll see what happens next. But it uh, doesn't look like we're going to stop anytime soon. When somebody tells you that your music is the soundtrack of their lives, what does that do for you? 
It makes you want to work harder. Really? Yeah. Yeah, because, uh, you know, we never thought that that would happen. You, you know, when you first uh, record records and, or write songs, you don't know if, if it's going to last or or not be a hit or a miss. And uh, we've had so much success that when people say that to us, it's like, man, with, uh, you know, I because we're going to keep playing these songs every night. And when they come to hear us, they're going to expect it to be as good as what they remember. And in order to do that, you got to practice. This stuff does not get easier from night to night. You got to, I, I was practicing. I was just warming up before we started the interview. And uh, I'm going to get back to it because I have a show tonight and uh, I'm going to try to be as good as I can. And that's the only way you got to put that horn in your face and, and work at it. I've had the chance to talk politics with Greta Van Susteren several times since she became our chief national political analyst in Washington, D.C. But this year, I had the chance to talk to her long form in a podcast interview, and we covered a lot of different issues, politics today versus uh, two or three decades ago, the time she spent at all three of the major cable networks, and the discussion got around to how she got her first chance to get on CNN many years ago. And she told me it actually developed through a contact she met at a toga party. That William Kenny Smith, who was um, was one of the Kennedy family members, was charged with rape down in Palm Beach, and CNN had CNN, which was still called Chicken Noodle Network among its colleagues. Um, people used to make fun of it because it was just sort of an upstart at that point. They decided to go gavel to gavel with um, covering the um, covering the William Kenny Smith case because in in Florida, unlike in D.C., they have cameras in the courtroom. So they called the American Bar Association in Washington D.C. and said. Who would you recommend to do, you know, do gavel to gavel coverage to do this kind of thing? And at the t and they recommended me. Person recommended me. At the time, I thought the person recommended me because I had tried these big cases, right. uh, violent violent crimes. Um, I had TV experience, which nobody had at the time, I mean, because there weren't any lawyers on TV at the time. And I had a second law degree, which women never had at the time, and it was in, it was in trial practice. And I was an adjunct professor uh, at Georgetown Law School teaching courses like evidence trial practice. So naturally, I thought it's because I, you know, I, I thought, okay, they, they were looking around to see who is the best qualified person to do this, and that, you know, that they thought of me. Well, that's not exactly what happened. What happened was this. In 1976, when I moved to Washington, D.C. to go to Georgetown Law School, I was a little bit shy, and a lot of my classmates had gone to real fancy Ivy League schools. I hardly knew where they were, you know, at the time. I mean, like, you know, I didn't know where all these schools were. I mean, right. but they're fancy schools. I went to the University of Wisconsin. You know, it cost me $284 a semester, and, you know, you know it, was a, and it was a great school to go to. But I didn't know. I was a little bit shy. And there was a group of um, a group of my classmates lived in a group house. I didn't. Um, and um, and they, they were having a party, a beer, uh, I guess, a beer party. But it was a toga party. And I, and I, I explained to me a toga party is that you wear a sheet like a toga. Well, I'd never been to a toga party, but I was happy to be invited to this party. So naturally, I wore a toga. I wore a sheet. It's the only toga party I've ever been to by anyone who asked. <laughs> and so I so I go over to this party and um, and I there's um. Uh, so I walk in, I'm a little bit shy, and there's some woman sitting down drinking beer who lived in the house, and she was not a law student, but she's in the group house. And, um, and we sat and talked the whole night. And, so, and we just had a conversation. It was very nice. All right, now, fast forward to about 2001. Okay. And I get a call from the American Bar Association asking me if I will go to London, fly to London, and be on a panel with Tony Blair's wife, Cherie Brown, or Cherie Blair, on, I forgot what the topic was and that they would pay for it. And I thought, are you kidding me? Sure. Flying me to London? Yeah. Um, and the American Bar Association, I was never a member of the American Bar Association because the dues were about $750. And my first 12 years of practicing law, I made about $12,000. I couldn't pay that kind of, I just, I mean, it was like, it was so over my head to be a member of the bar. And so now they're asking me to, they're going to fly me to London for this conference. So I, and this is, this is after I'd had been at CNN for about six years and had right. been on television. So naturally I went, well, I go in there. And um, I walk up to the table feeling like it's a little bit shy still. And there's a woman handing out the names that say, you know, hello, my name is whatever it is. And I go up and I, mind, I say, my name is uh, 
Greta Van Susteren, and she goes, um, uh, uh, I know you. And I go, oh, she said, she said, do you recognize me? And I think to myself, okay, I don't recognize her, you know. And I, but I'm, but I'm gonna be polite. I said, you look familiar. And she said, uh, um, well, I work for the ABA. And I said, oh, great. She said, I'm the one who recommended you to do the William Kenny Smith for CNN. And I thought, oh, she, you know, the receptionist had. And I thought to myself, so it wasn't this big group gathering together and looking at my credentials and thinking I was well qualified. It was just happening to be someone who answered the phone who no doubt had seen me on TV doing the mayor's trial the year before. So I was a little bit, I thought, okay, you know, I, all these years I thought it was because I was so qualified for it. And, then, uh, and it turned out it wouldn't be that. And then she said to me, she said, but don't you recognize me? And I said, you sure look familiar. She said, I was at that toga, toga party. party. You and I sat and talked to him. So, so basically, here's the story. So <laughs> I ended up on TV not because I had two law degrees, tried these cases, um, was an adjunct professor at Georgetown, had some experience, but because I went to a toga party <laughs> and I was shy, this other young woman was shy too, and she didn't know all these fancy students there, and I didn't know all the fancy students, so we just sat and drank beer and talked for the night. So it was based on a toga party is how I ended up on television. That's our year in review for 2021. Season five of the One on One with John Evans podcast is now in the books. We thank you for listening. We thank you for sharing your feedback, and we look forward to seeing you in 2022. I'm John Evans. Thanks once again for listening to this episode and this season of One on One.